Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the semin seminar on leadership and the workplace. Our host for today's seminar is the Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, Dr. Laura Juner. I love it when people introduce me so I don't have to say that hideously long title all by myself. I have been bouncing around this building for 20 years and I have never seen this room this full. So that's a, I think that's a testament to how important the topics we're going to discuss are to us. Um, before I begin, I do want to thank uh, the First Lady's Joining Forces team and the uh, Vice President's team for joining us. Are you here? I see. Thank you. Thank you. I can tell you from a, the perspective of a defense leader and a former spouse, the work you do is so important. So thank you for the work you do and for being here. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome Ms. Cheryl Sandberg to the building um, and, and the privilege of introducing her. It's a, it's a little bit of a scary honor because the work she's done has been so meaningful to me and clearly to most of you. Cheryl's a leading um, technology executive in this country. She's currently serving, as you well know, as the chief operating officer of Facebook. But more importantly, she's a leading public thinker on issues relating to leadership and gender and has been fittingly recognized by time as one of the most influential people on the globe. Her New York Times best-selling book, Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead, is probably the most widely talked about piece on women in the workplace in a decade or more. Her TED Talk, Why We Have Too Few Women Leaders, has been viewed millions of times and translated into 44 languages. Her work has ignited a public discussion on women in the workplace and leadership in general and inspired new policies within top American corporations. She's challenged us to find ways to change the numbers of women at the top and to make our world and the world our children will inhabit different. The conversation's particularly important for us in the Pentagon today because we're in the midst of a lot of dynamic changes and some of those changes are extraordinarily and wonderful. Every day we're opening up more occupations to women in the military and that's exciting and historic and the uh, hearing Cheryl's common sense views on how to make the most of those opportunities is a, a very fitting discussion for us today. Some of the changes are a little less certain. Um, we know that we're going to be smaller, and this is our total DOD force, civilians and military alike. And our, the demands on this force are going to be more complex over time, and what that means is every one of you matters. We have to, with a smaller workforce, we have to make the most of all of your potential. We have to be the employer of choice. We also have to work to support, motivate, and make sure that we enable you to commit fully to develop your talents. Cheryl's work speaks directly to these challenges, and she's been gracious enough to lend her expertise at all levels of the department, not just at the senior levels, but even to our students. On behalf of the administration and the department, I want to say thank you for being here and thank you for your commitment to our men and women and the civilians that work with them. Your counsel is always illuminating and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Ms. Sandberg. Thank you, uh, Dr. Junior. Thank you so much for this kind invitation. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, and I'll start by thanking you for your service. My great-grandparents fled uh, very severe anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe to get to this country. The opportunities I, I have are because of them and because of the sacrifices people here make to keep us safe and free, and I'm truly grateful for them. For the men who are here today, I have good news for you. Gloria Steinem says you come to one voluntary event like this and you get a pass when the inevitable revolution happens. <laughs> So let's start by congratulating you on an excellent use of your own time. <laughs> and to the women here who are leading and serving our country, I thank you not just for your service, but for the example you set. Because I believe in this industry, for every one of you who comes to work every day, you are not just fighting for equality, but you are proving equality 
every, with every day and every step you take, and I'm particularly grateful to you, so thank you. The first time I ever used the words lean in were at the Naval Academy. I was invited to give the Forrestal Lecture, which is a lecture on leadership, and it made me, gave me a chance to think about leadership and how it might be different from Facebook uh, to the military. At Facebook, one of our mottos is move fast and break things. I'm super glad you don't have that motto. <laughs> because you might actually break, explode. It could be really ugly. But in a lot of ways, leadership is very similar across any sector. And that way is that in order to get real leadership, real leadership is about people not just following you because they have to and because you've told them to do something and you're their commanding officer, but because they want to and they believe. They follow you with passion and enthusiasm because you share the same goal and you inspire them. And what is core to that kind of leadership is the ability to use the full talents of the population, to get the very best from everyone, regardless of gender or race or background or age. And to this day, I'm one of the only women and the only businesswoman to have ever delivered the Forrestal Lecture. And that speaks to the larger challenge we have, which is we are not getting women into leadership roles in real numbers in any sector. Women have 5% of the Fortune 500 CEO jobs, 20% of the Senate, one Army general, as a four-star was. Now there are none. You all know the numbers, and it's true across every industry. And what's worse is that I think we really suffer from the tyranny of low expectations. Just a few years ago, women won 20% of the seats in the US Senate. And all the headlines screamed out, women take over the Senate, women take over the Senate. They're like, OK, 50% of the population with 20% of the seats, how bad at math can we be as a country? <laughs> that's not a takeover, that's a gap. And what that means is that we are holding our performance back. Women are not represented at the decisions, at the tables where decisions are made, and it means we make worse decisions because we know that studies of diversity tell us conclusively that more diverse companies, more diverse organizations, more diverse leadership teams make better decisions. In fact, the less diverse a team it is, the worse its performance is, and the more confident it is that its performance is good. <laughs> so we know that leadership, all leadership, leadership of all is important is important. And what I think will make the really big difference is if we can make sure we explain that as mission critical leadership. I heard when I had a chance to visit Quantico from many Marines, many of our Marine leaders who had been on the ground in Afghanistan, that there were tasks that needed to be done to secure Afghanistan that women were better equipped to do. There were female Marines who were able to do things on the ground that male Marines couldn't. That is just one example of how diversity can be mission critical. And I think the more our messages on why we want more female leaders, why we want more diverse leadership in terms of race, are not just that it's the right thing to do and a good thing to do, because it is, but because it's mission critical. Because it'll create a stronger army, a stronger navy, a stronger air force, a stronger marines. It will create a stronger company. It will create better results. The better off we can be. The hard thing is that we know we're, at, we're, we know we're not increasing the women in leadership. We know there's been essentially no progress in corporate America for 10 years. There's been no progress in the wage gap for 10 years. But these topics are really hard to talk about, really hard to talk about. As a woman coming up in my career, I never spoke about being a woman. Because if you speak about being a woman, the person on the other side of the table thinks you're whining, complaining, asking for special treatment, or in my industry, about to sue them. <laughs> And if you think about it from a man's point of view, you mentioned my TED Talk. Some of you may have seen it. What would have happened if a male CEO would have given my TED Talk? I said the exact same things I said. I think he would have gotten fired for being sexist. So it's hard for women to talk about it, because especially in male-dominated industries, you all work in one, I work in one, we're busy fitting in, not thinking that we want to raise our hand for special treatment. And it's hard for men to talk about it, because you're afraid by talking about it, you'll say slightly the wrong thing and someone will get accused you of being sexist. Which, of course, you're not, because that's why you're talking about it in the first place. We need to change all that. What we're currently doing is not working. The veil of silence is not creating an equal playing field. We need to acknowledge the issues, acknowledge the biases, 
and counteract them. So I'm going to talk today about three biases women face, performance, likability, and responsibility. But what's really important to understand is that surfacing bias and being willing to acknowledge it is a good first step, but it is not enough. We have to surface bias and we need to counteract it. People call this a bias interrupter, and I'll give you an example. At Google, where I used to work, people put themselves up for promotion in engineering. You decide when you're ready and you put yourself up. So not surprisingly, more men at the same levels and the same levels of experience and performance were putting themselves up than women. The head of HR at Google went out to the company and said, everyone, more men are putting themselves up for promotion. We want to see more women put themselves up too. And then they trained the managers to encourage women to put themselves up before they felt ready. What happened? Men and women are now putting themselves up for promotion at the same levels. So you understand the bias and you create their interrupter. So I'm going to talk about the three biases. And the important thing to understand about these biases is one, I come with no judgments. Biases, stereotypes, this is part of the human condition and women have them just as much as men. As humans, we process 99% of the information we process quickly, implicitly. We, cannot, we do not have time for deductive reasoning. By the time I see an animal walking towards me and I think, huh, four legs, fur, tail, that's a lion, I'm dead. <laughs> I need to implicitly understand it's a lion and run the other way. That means that the stereotypes we're all raised with, we hold them deeply and we react without even realizing, it, or realizing we're doing it. So the first, the performance bias. All of us, all of us, women and men, systematically overestimate male performance and underestimate female performance. This starts with babies crawling. If you ask mothers how far their infants crawled, they get it wrong with their sons a little high and they get it wrong with their daughters a little low. When you ask women how they performed themselves, they get it wrong a little low and men get it wrong a little high. You see this when you see gender or race blind studies. So in Boston, you may have seen this, they auditioned orchestra members behind a veil. What happened? They hired more women. Some of those women had been subbing for that orchestra, but they couldn't see it till gender was gone. They do studies on race, give out resumes, take off the names. A white name gets 50% more callbacks on the exact same resume than a name that sounds black. That means that being white gives you eight years of experience in the workforce. None of us are doing this on purpose, but we are all doing it. The other performance bias we have is not just how we measure performance, but how we attribute performance. So when a male succeeds, we all think it's because of his skills. And that's probably true. When a woman succeeds, we believe it's because she worked hard, had help from others, or got lucky. The individual believes that, the woman and the man, and the people around them. Well, that's a really big difference. Because if you succeeded because of your own skills or someone succeeded before of his own skills, you can put him up for the next promotion because you know he can bring those skills to bear. But if you succeeded because you got lucky, well, you can't count on that happening again. I met earlier this morning with the flag officers of the Navy, and I had a small meeting with some of the senior women before I did a speech to the whole group. And one of them said, oh my god, that's exactly right. Women come to me all the time. They're like, I'm not sure I'm ready for the promotion. I'm not sure I'm ready for the next assignment. Can you check my credentials? Men come in, they're like, I'm ready for the promotion. How am I getting there? And that's exactly the experience I've had, I've had in corporate America. So how do you correct? We have to acknowledge the bias. You have to be willing to say. And what's really important to understand is that organizations and people who think they are meritocratic who think they have objective standards, actually have the most bias. That explains a lot of what's happening in technology and explains a lot of what's happening in the military. At Facebook, we think we're awesome. We think we are unbiased. We think we can measure everything. You can ship code or not. It's totally measurable. It's not. The important thing to understand is that what the standards are in the first place has also been set in what is a biased way. Inevitably, unavoidably. There was a study done of police chiefs asking people to select who should be police chief. And there were a group of resumes that were handed out that had very experience-heavy resumes, 30 years on the street as a great police officer. 
Then there was a group of resumes handed out that had academic heavy resumes, not as many years on the street, but really good academic credentials. When they asked people to pick the objective criteria by which you would select a police chief, whatever the males had were the things people picked. People who got the resumes where the males had a lot of street experience thought that was more important. People who got resumes where the, you know, the males had more academic credentials, they thought that was more important. Even in setting the objective standards by which we judge people, there is subjectivity and it has been set by the people who are in power. And I've had lots of conversations across the military and across corporate America where people will acknowledge that some of the things that were historically important are still important, but some new things are equally important and we need to add more things to the list. Once we understand these biases, we can overcome them. Second, the likability bias. Everywhere in the world, no matter what our backgrounds are, no matter how different our societies are, our stereotypes of men and women are actually exactly the same. Everywhere, we believe men should be leaders and successful and powerful. And everywhere, we believe women should be givers and caregivers and communal, do for the people around them. That is why power and success are positively correlated with likability and negatively for men and negatively correlated for women. And this is so important to understand because this is part of why, a huge part of why, we don't have women in leadership. As a man gets more powerful and successful, he's better liked. Why? Because he's conforming with our expectations. We expect him to be a lion. He's acting like a lion. When women get more powerful and successful, they are less liked. There's a woman who works for me, man, sorry, who works for me at Facebook, and he started this conversation not joking by saying, I didn't read your book. <laughs> if you were one of the five people who worked directly for me at Facebook, you would either read my book or pretend to, right? <laughs> I mean, read an article or two and pretend, but he said, no, I didn't read your book. But I did listen to all the things you've been saying all these years, and I got feedback that a woman who works for me is too aggressive by men and women. So rather than write too aggressive in her performance review, I went back to those people who said it, and I said, can I ask you a question? What did she do that was too aggressive in the specific? And they answered the question. And then he said, if a man had done those exact same things, would you have thought he was too aggressive? And to a person, they said no. Our biases against female leadership run deep, and they start early. Men only, please, men only, raise your hand if anyone's ever called you when you were a child bossy. Men only. There's always a few. <laughs> Women, raise your hand if you were called bossy as a little girl. <laughs> bossy is a super interesting word. We don't use it for little boys because when a little boy leads, it's expected. But when a little girl leads, it's not. So what can you do? What's the bias interrupter? This one you can fix. The next time you hear a woman is too aggressive, too ambitious, political, not as well liked by her peers, you understand it, you diagnose it, get it down to the specifics. And this weekend, go to a playground. Someone will call a little girl bossy, probably her parents. You walk up with a big smile. You say, that little girl's not bossy. That little girl has executive leadership skills. <laughs> I'm going to pause for one moment on that. Just one moment. I'm going to say it the other way. That little boy has executive leadership skills. No humor. That's because humor is about going about our expectations. It's funny because you're surprised. If you want to understand why there are no four-star female generals in the Army right now and why Silicon Valley has two female CEOs, you just understood it. We do not like leadership in girls and women. But we can and we should, because it might do the world a whole lot of good to have more women with executive leadership skills. Number three, the responsibility bias. A friend of mine had a daughter. She was five years old. She said to her mother, I have a problem. And she said, well, what's the problem? I want to be an astronaut. This is before NASA kind of backed away from that whole thing. <laughs> so that wasn't the problem. She said, well, why is that a problem? He said, well, the boy I like wants to be an astronaut, too. But we can't both go into space. Someone has to watch our kids. 
I think it will have to be me. That little girl's right. 70% of mothers work, most work full time. Even for two working parents, the women bear the great majority of the responsibility in the home for housework and childcare. That changes how women approach careers from the very beginning. Think of a career like a marathon. You get to the front, the start line, equally fit and trained, men and women. You could argue that with women getting 57% of the college degrees in this country, women are better fit and trained, but we're generous, so we're going to give you half. <laughs> equally fit and trained, the gun goes off. What happens? What are the voices the men hear as they start running? You've got this. Good job. Keep going. What are the voices the women hear? Are you sure you want to start running? Why start a race you're probably not going to finish? Careers continue. Race goes on. What are the voices the men hear? You've got this. Keep going. What are the voices the women hear? Should you be at work when your child needs you at home? Men. Men only. Raise your hand if anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? Raise your hand. Men only. Only men. Never gotten a hand. Women, raise your hand if anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? We constantly tell women they can't have it all, language I truly hate, which means you can't be a mother and have a career. But guess what? Most women have to work. They have to do both. So our constant messages that tell them they can't are really detrimental. Now, there's a really good reason for men to do more at home. In families where chores are split more evenly, those marriages are happier. Gay couples actually split chores fairly evenly. Heterosexual couples don't. But when they do, they, they, those couples are happier. Lower divorce rates, more happiness, more sex. Probably inappropriate to joke about that at the Pentagon, but there's data behind this. <laughs> there's data behind this. I tell men all over the world, you want to do something nice for your wife? Don't buy flowers, do laundry. <laughs> the CEO of FTD heard me say that on a late night TV show. He sent me the largest bouquet you've ever seen with a note. Can't you tell men to do laundry and buy flowers? So on his behalf, buy the flowers too. But if you're only going to do one, definitely do the laundry. For your children, and this is really important, at any income level, regardless of how active a mother is, children with more engaged fathers do better. They do better in school, they do better professionally, they are stronger emotionally, they are happier. This is good stuff. Equality will help, even with the demanding careers we have. That equality is especially important in the military. In all branches, 46% of married women are married to other men in the military. 5% of married men are married to women in the military, which means that making couples available to do both is going to be critical, critical to getting more women to stay in the military, stay in the civilian force that's supporting the military, and move up the ranks in places like the Pentagon. Women don't just have the responsibility bias at work. They have it at home. Sorry, at home. They have it at work. Women do more office housework communal tasks, serving on the committees, mentoring, taking the notes. I just spoke at West Point. They have something they call take boards, where they break people into groups. You all probably know much more about this than I do. And they do assignments where they're looking for leadership skills. Guess who's taking the notes? The women. Why? Because they think they have better handwriting. If you're observing, <laughs> no, this is true. I was at West Point three weeks ago. If you're looking at a group, and you're observing, you're the commanding officer observing, and you're looking for leadership, Who's going to be the natural leader, the person making, taking the notes or the person speaking? I watch this all day in corporate America. Women take the notes. The woman taking the notes almost never makes the killer point that gets her the promoted and gets her noticed. And so sharing those communal tax in the office, office housework, that will matter a great deal to leadership too. I believe that the United States military has an incredibly important role to play here. Incredibly important role. If you look at the history of desegregation, the military led. A lot of the good things that happened in our society happened here first. That means if we want to increase our progress along racial discrimination, if we want to increase our progress along the leadership gap for women and people of color, the military has to lead. 
and the military can lead. I'm here because I was invited by your senior leaders and some great women who followed up and made it happen. I spent the morning speaking to the flag officers of the Navy. I've been to Quantico and the Naval Academy in West Point. These are your leaders inviting me because I think the people in this audience, the leaders really care. Doing this explicitly will make a big difference. At any level, if you are a man or you're a woman and you are willing to talk openly about the biases, we have a handout we're giving out somewhere here. Hopefully you'll get it. If not, all the information's available for free on leanin.org. Talk about this, do it openly and explicitly support women. Along with my book, a couple years ago, started a foundation, leanin.org. We help women and men form lean-in circles. 10 people who meet once a month with an agenda that we provide for free, educational materials we provide. You can register for free on our site. We were hoping for 1,000 circles. There are now 22,500 in over 105 countries in all five military branches at West Point, at the Naval Academy, and increasing across all the service academies too. Explicit, explicit support for women, by women and men will make a big difference. When we started the Naval, the cat circles at the Naval Academy, then Admiral Miller asked senior officers at the Naval Academy to mentor each circle, men as well as women, to show the deep support that was there. Lieutenant Commander Emily Bassett runs a group of lean-in circles in Norfolk, Virginia. All of her circle members are women who are commanding warships or are in line to command warships. And she's talked to us about how those circles have empowered her and her fellow members to believe they could take the next step. Rachel Grimsey, is Rachel here? Right down there. Rachel's talked to us, a young woman working at the Pentagon, about how her circle is helping encourage female leadership at the Pentagon, and we're grateful for your leadership. Do it explicitly by joining circles. Do it out loud by talking about biases. But let your voice be heard on why diversity and leadership is mission critical, why you think it will make you a better leader, why it will be good for your career, and why you think it is so important. Meritocratic organizations and people, as I said before, often have the worst outcomes. They did an experiment, a computer simulation of looking at bias and performance. And they gave the women ratings 1 to 100, and they gave the men ratings 1 to 101. 1% 1 bias, not much. All the studies say we have biases in real life that are much bigger than that. They then modeled 15% attrition. And every time we had attrition, you promoted the people below with the highest ratings. In 20 cycles of this, which isn't so many performance cycles, with just a 1% performance bias, the organization at the top went from being 50-50 at the bottom to 35% women. Tiny biases will make a big difference. That means that your voice on the small bias interrupters, starting to mentor circles, start circles, that will make a huge, huge difference. I believe the results of equality will be profound. Faster economic growth. If women were in the workforce in the United States at the same rate as men, economists predict 5% greater GDP growth. Anyone who's looking at the GDP projections says that it's 25 to 3% as far as the eye can see. Can you imagine what an additional 5% growth would do for this country? Anyone who looks at the performance of teams know that diverse teams make better decisions. I think Facebook has an important mission. I'm proud to work on it. I don't think anything is as important as the mission you all have. You keep us safe. You keep the world open to democracy. And boy, is it a complicated, scary world out there. What you do has never been more important using the full talents of the population, using the very best of everyone, can only make us stronger, both at the Pentagon, in all of the services, but also across everything we do. I want to thank you again for your service, for my freedom. I want to thank you again for caring enough to be here. And I want to encourage and applaud you to do just a little bit more to get us to equality, because if you do this, the rest of the country will follow. Thank you.
questions? Yeah. Questions, comments, stand up, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Seriously, the more direct, the better. Yeah. Hi, Kathleen Walker, Can you share with the audience here any interesting comment or question that was asked this morning? <laughs> <laughs> it was really interesting. I had a chance to meet with some of the leaders, some of the female admirals in a smaller group, and then I spoke to the, uh, the flag officers. I, there's a conference I do that I think they do it once a year here. Um, and what was really interesting was talking about some of the issues they face. So one of the really important issues that's happening in the military is because of the things I talked about, it's really hard to be a woman and actually identify as a woman. So I was invited by then General Amos, the Commandant, to go to Quantico about a year ago, not even a year ago. And he had a meeting of all the female, a lot of the female senior Marines, including the one general, General Reynolds, who was there. And a whole bunch of them told me that they've never been to a meeting of all women and had the commandant not invited them themselves, they would not have come. I heard this morning at the Navy and I heard in earlier meetings today at the Pentagon from the Army that it's really hard for women to even show up to something that's for women because it feels like we're asking for special treatment, it feels like we're not tough enough, it feels like we think the standards should be lowered for us. I understand that because I went through most of my career that way. But that shows us how far we have to come, how we have to make this safe, how we have to say, not only can you come to a meeting of all women, not only should we have circles for you and programs for you, but it's mission critical for you to do this because we need you to stay in. So the Naval Academy, we know that by the time they graduate, 80% of the female cadets have already decided to leave the Navy, and that's a number that's much higher than the men. They've already decided. So we know there are going to be fewer of them in that room where I smoked this morning the day they graduate. We know that women are sorting in to different professions than men. We see it in corporate America. We see it in the military. If you look at the Fortune 500, you've got 5% CEOs. And then below them, you have 20-ish percent women in executive jobs. But if you look at what jobs they're in, they're in communications, they're in PR, they're in legal. Those are great fields, and those are super important. But I don't know of a single Fortune 500 CEO who was head of HR before he or she, usually he got the job. And so if you look at the pipeline, the pipeline's not there because the women are not in engineering, sales, and marketing, which is where you get promoted into CEO. Same thing's happening in the military. A huge percentage of women are sorting into the support fields. They're sorting into the support fields for good reason, but there are only going to be so many three- and four-star generals coming from those support fields. And so these were the conversations we were having about how we get women. Now, I know there's a lot going on here about what MOSs are going to be open to women, and I don't pretend to have the expertise to weigh in on that. But here's what I do know. 95% of MOSs in the Army are open to women. 88% of MOSs in the Navy. And we don't see women even taking advantage of the opportunities they have yet. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not arguing against opening more for women. I think that's probably a very good idea. But I'm saying even as that battle ensues, boy, could we do a lot to get women into the fields where they could get promoted. What I see in corporate America is that because women are leaning back, because they know they're going to bear the responsibility, because like that five-year-old girl, they think they're going to have to stay home, they don't sort into the harder jobs. They don't raise their hand for promotions. Now, what happens? Fast forward 20 years, here's the bad news. They're working just as hard. They're just getting paid less and not as senior and reporting to some guy who was leaning in more than they were. They're not even getting more flexibility. They're just getting lower jobs and lower pay. And so starting out, going into some of the harder fields, even if you're just keeping your options open, is a really good thing. I had this conversation with at um, General Amos' invitation. I spent a whole probably four hours with all the three-star generals of the Marine Corps a little while ago. And a bunch of them said, you're right. Every time a woman comes to see me, I tell her to go into intelligence or communications. I never thought about that before. I should be telling her to go into operations or logistics. We promote more generals into those. They can go into those. And so those type of changes are the conversations we're having. Powered study in mind. 
Yeah, it's really important. So as you start, the Heidi Howard study was an HBS case study where they had a case of a woman who's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And she was a very successful executive, and then she used that to become a very successful venture capitalist. So they changed some professors at Columbia, took the case study, and they changed half the names to Howard, and they gave out Heidi and Howard to the class. And then they surveyed the students. And women and men thought they were both confident, but Howard's a really great guy, and you really want to work for him, and Heidi's selfish and political, and you don't want to work for her. <laughs> That's the likability problem for women. Men can be both nice and competent, and they reinforce each other. As they're more competent, you like them better, they're nicer. But when women seem competent, they're not nice. So Heidi's clearly competent in the study. She must not be nice. You can't be both as a woman. Um, and so I think the question is to educate and talk about this. Now, I will say, talking about this is really scary. I mean, much to my own personal embarrassment, the first time I spoke out about being a woman was five years ago. I'm 45 years old. I've been in the workforce for two decades pretty successfully. I could have spoken out, and I didn't. I didn't because I didn't want to get fired, and I didn't want to be the woman, and I didn't want anyone to think I was whining. And even when I did speak out, people told me I would lose my career, that I couldn't possibly be taken seriously as a business executive if I was speaking out as a woman. And you know, today's a vacation day for me. This is what I do with my vacation time now. I speak out as a woman. <laughs> but, but, but it is hard. We started talking about race more at Google and at Facebook in the time I was there. And, and, and originally, as you talk about it, sometimes people who are in those groups, the women, the minorities, are like, don't do that. Because there's a performance bias already. And if we think there's affirmative action, that makes the performance bias worse, right? We're already undervaluing people of color and who are women. And if everyone thinks there's affirmative action, now you're like, oh yeah, you're there because you're a woman. I became the Treasury Department Chief of Staff when I was you know, about 29, 30. I cannot tell you how many people said to me, it must be great to be a girl. You got that job. <laughs> it's not something anyone wants to hear, so we have to talk about it in the right ways. Mission critical. Mission critical is so important because everyone wants better results. Better results mean peace here. Better results mean security for our country. In my company, better results mean growth and more jobs and more people connected on Facebook. Everyone's for that. And the second thing is we have to be clear that we're not trying to unlevel the playing field. We're trying to level it by exposing the biases that data exposes. And that's why, if you read my book, it's very data-driven. You know, study after study after study, and that's why. Yeah. I just get a question from a man. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you mentioned, I, I was taken by your comment about, oh, thanks. I was met, uh, taken by your comment about asking the question of, do you want to start a race that you can't finish? I'm curious if you might want to comment about uh, military spouses, be they male or female, uh, who might find themselves moving around every two to three or four years, um, and how that can affect their sort of um, desire to, um, to take or to start the race that they may not be able to finish. Yeah. Look, it's a really big issue, and every, every industry is going to have to work out how to have more flexibility than we have in order to change the numbers for women. We know that. Right. It occurs to me that a lot of the structures we have and the expectations we have of career progression really were set in place both in corporate America and the military 30 years ago. What's happened in the last 30 years? Lifespans dramatically increased. People are living longer and they're living healthier. I'm going to turn 50 and 50 is now the new 30. <laughs> <laughs> but if you actually look how people are living and working, people are healthier, longer, living longer. So. You know, the tenure clock was always six years. Maybe it could be eight or nine. Half of these professors are hanging around till they're 70. Maybe we can give them till they're 34 to make tenure, not 30. Wouldn't that make a big difference? Same thing with military careers. I think people need to think about some of the things that we might want to change, where, which are completely compatible with the increasing lifespan we have and the ability to serve. Small changes. In some of the meetings I had here earlier, a couple of things came up. In a lot of places, on a lot of bases, or a lot of places people are going to work, PT starts at 6 a.m. and childcare opens at 6 a.m. A woman told the story of being in a long line of women trying to drop off their babies. Well, someone said, just leave the baby and go. Like, it's a baby. <laughs> right? But like, if, if diversity were, if we wanted women to stay in, if it were mission critical, which it is, 
maybe we could figure out how to open the childcare 15 minutes earlier or start PT 15 minutes later. But someone can figure out that we can't be in the same place. A woman upstairs, very senior woman in the US Army, told me she gave up breastfeeding because there was nowhere to pump. How hard can it be to put a room for women to have privacy so they can you know, pump when they're breastfeeding? That just can't be hard, but it's not happening. And so there are a bunch of these changes that are structural, and I know we'll take legislation, such as some of the career pathing, but there are a bunch of really important changes y'all could go make today. Today. Today we could get PT and child care to start with a 15-minute gap on those bases. Make a big difference. Yeah. Uh, there's a group in the Pentagon, Senior Professional Women, and we have found that women do not mentor other women, and men mentor much better, and they tend to men mentor men. Can you address that issue for us? And by yeah. the way, side, we do have pumping rooms in the Pentagon now. Good job. Yeah, it's a really big issue. So there are two things going on. Partially, it's that part of it's true, and it's true historically, and it's still true, that in a lot of situations, if you believe only one woman's getting promoted, you actually are competing with the other woman in a room. And so there's historically some competition that was very real. It's also the case that any group that has been historically discriminated against, the first members of that group that break into that group often take on the characteristics of the group that was in power. So I'm Jewish. You know, 30 years in this country, not that my family was this, my family were immigrants, but there were Jews who got into the first country clubs that didn't let Jews. Often those Jews were the ones saying, let's not let in any Jews. We don't want to ruin the place. <laughs> they wanted to be part of the majority that let them in. And you see that with women. You see that across lots of different things. That's a historical anomaly. Another thing that's going on, and this is really important, is that we have higher expectations of women for favors than men. When I was writing my book, I thought about all the women in my career who were nice to me. But I thought of a lot of women in the career I thought were actually pretty mean. <laughs> And then I looked at the data about how we expect greater niceness for women, and then I asked myself the hard question of, huh, were they actually mean, or did I expect more from them because they were women? And I wrote in my book, I expected more because they were women. I thought they were going to help me more. And so we have to change our expectations. The best thing that can happen are lean-in circles or other small groups. So I went to a lean-in circle meeting at the Air Force. It was incredible. A woman who's senior in the Air Force told me that she's not at all terrified to jump out of planes and land in enemy territory. And for those of you who don't know that, that's actually really scary. <laughs> that's not like a normal thing to do. But talking to her commanding officer about gender bias, there was no way she was doing that. That's terrifying. Similarly, another senior woman said that until she started coming to the lean-in circle, she didn't realize that she was one of those women who was mean to women. She thought she was helping them. She needed to be tough. She thought she was toughening them up. She was going to help them get to where she got by doing what happened to her. And so more communication, more explicit circles, formats for women to do this, and support each other, and men, men to be part of that can make a really big difference. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. against gender discrimination? Does that concern you? And if it does, what should we be doing about that? So I'm not a constitutional expert. <laughs> um, but I do think uh, more, more, more protections for more groups are really important. There's a huge statewide battle right now against protections uh, for members of the LGBT community. I think more protection across the board legally is really important. It's also the case that actually Understanding these biases and counteracting them is really, really important. I see companies out there with the best corporate policies you could ever have. Facebook, we offer four months maternity, four months paternity. We're the most flexible workforce in the world. We still don't have a lot of women at the top. Look at Norway. Norway's interesting. Norway has the best public policy in the world on women, the best. 40% quotas for boards, 40% quotas for, CE, for, um, for boards for the parliament the best maternity and paternity years of it. Can't take all of it. I don't know how they get that much. If the men don't take it, they get it. Do you know how many women run Norway's big companies? 3.4%. We can't legislate. We, we should legislate this stuff, but we can't only legislate. We are also going to need to fix the bias against female leadership. As long as we all steal, and I think it's funny, too, that a little girl has executive leadership skills, we are not going to solve the problem. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for Ms. Sandberg. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain at your seats. Please remain at your seats while our special guests depart. I'm not used to everyone just standing. Please just hold tight. She's on a tight schedule and she has to get to the next location. Thank you. <laughs>